um, our speaker is Olivier Solpris from McGill University. Thank you, Claire, uh, for the introduction. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to present to you some of my PhD results. I'm going to try to answer the question of where and how much calcium carbonate is dissolving each year uh, at the bottom of the ocean due to ocean acidification. And how does that affect the global carbonate budget? So these days, each year, we are emitting about 10 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere, and about 25% of that ends up in the ocean. According to the business as usual uh, scenario, or the, uh, the RCP 8.5 scenario, uh, it should continue during the next century as we are here following it pretty closely. So Andrea did a, a, an excellent job this morning uh, introducing the carbonate system, so I'm going to go very fast on that. Basically, when you add CO2 into seawater, you are pushing all the species on this graph on the left. So we have uh, more CO2, we have less carbonate ions, some of these guys, and we are lowering the pH. And that's something we can measure if you look at this time series here uh, in these three different places. We measure the pH uh, decreasing. Uh, we also see a carbonate ion decrease. And that has some big impacts for calcium uh, carbonate minerals. This morning, you heard about calcification, about how uh, the, the loss of carbonate ion makes it harder for organisms to build up their shells. Here, I'm going to take the reaction the other way around and, talk, and tell you about this solution. So here is a way to represent thermodynamics. You can basically conceptualize any chemical reaction with a seesaw. So instead of having kids on each side with their respective weights, you have uh, reactants and reaction products. And we'll think about their construction, their activities, or their thermodynamic potential. <laughs> and when it's balanced, it's at equilibrium. But because of ocean acidification, which is lowering the construction of that carbonate ion, it's not equilibrium anymore. And an easy way to go back to equilibrium is to dissolve some of that calcite to replace the carbonate ion that is gone. This can be summed up by this overall uh, reaction. Uh, that is called the, uh, the geochemical uh, carbonate composition by opposition to the biological composition that Bernie described this morning. Here you can see that CO2 is at the same time causing calcium carbonate to dissolve more, but it's also being neutralized by this same uh, dissolution reaction. And that's an illustration of that very important uh, feedback mechanism that regulates CO2 uh, content in the atmosphere and in the ocean on long time scales. Here uh, are a couple of maps showing a model run by Ridgewell and Hargreaves. Uh, they use the scenario in which they burn all the fossil fuel reserves that we have on Earth until 2400 or something, and then they stop because we run out of fossil fuels to burn. And they uh, study how the calcite content in sediments is changing. So when it's uh, red and yellow, sediments are very rich in calcite. When it's dark blue, like in North Pacific, we have no calcite. As we go further in time, uh, calcite disappears in the sediment. It's being dissolved uh, because it's more CO2 is added into the ocean. That dissolution neutralizes this excess CO2. And eventually, after 10,000 years or so, uh, we, we actually uh, we have neutralized enough CO2 so that the calcite can come back. And eventually, we go back to where we're at the beginning. So that's typically a, a negative feedback loop. Uh, here is what we, uh, where we are at today in this, uh, in this feedback loop. Uh, we have already a lot of uh, anthropogenic carbon. This map uh, shows you the construction per square meter of surface ocean. It has been integrated over the world water column depths. Uh, it's from Katiwala. And uh, uh, we have a lot of anthropogenic CO2 here in north of the Atlantic Ocean. That's because uh, at this place, where the big downwelling of surface waters, they are going all the way down to the bottom waters. And we have anthropogenic CO2. We have CFC. We have lead. We have all kind of anthropogenic stuff from the surface to the bottom. We also have a pretty high concentration of uh, anthropogenic CO2 uh, at the south, where we also have a couple of downwellings. Uh, and if we look at the numbers here, we see that it's very not balanced. 55% uh, of all the anthropogenic CO2, that's according to this data set, is located within the top 100 meters of the ocean. And below one kilometer, even though that's where you have more than three quarters of the total volume of seawater in the ocean, you only have 4% of all the anthropogenic CO2. And what's going to happen uh, in the future, uh, as 
as a surface water sinks here in the north, and also we have another entrance window at the south of the Atlantic, that all that CO2 is going to go from the surface to the bottom. It's going to spread uh, along the bottom, and all the, the sediments are going to be uh, surrounded by bottom waters that is more and more acidic. Okay. Here is a little diagram that I took from a paper by Bernie Boudreau, uh, where you can see very well uh, the calcite saturation depths. Uh, that's the red dashed line here. Uh, it's been defined already, but I'm going to go very quick. It's the depths below which the carbonate ion concentration that we have in seawater becomes smaller than the concentration we would need to be at equilibrium with respect to calcite. So calcitic, calcitic grains are falling there from the surface to the bottom. And as soon as they cross that depth, they start dissolving abiotically. Uh, but they will actually, we will form them in the sediment up to another depth that can be a couple of kilometers below the saturation depth. That is called the, cal the calcite compensation depth. Strictly speaking, it's the depth at which the calcite flux uh, is exactly equal to the calcite dissolution rate. So that, in theory, we don't find any calcite in the sediment below the depth. So I prepared a little animation here to show uh, how these two depths are related with each other and how, uh, how they are related to the calcite content in sediment. So the red sheet here represents the saturation depths. It's computed with GLODAP data. Uh, the calcite composition depth is just below. I'm going to remove the saturation depths after so that you can see better. And here on the top of the, of the seafloor, here you see the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, we, we can actually represent the calcite content. So when it's white, it's very rich in calcite, and with dark brown, uh, these sediments contain no calcite. So here we go. Uh, let's remove the saturation depths here. Uh, pay attention to what's happening here in the Pacific. We have a lot of calcite here on the top of that mid-ocean ridge, uh, but here, below the calcite composition depth, it's all dark. It's all dissolved. Uh, so if we want to predict uh, the time it will take for, uh, for calcite to be dissolved, for the CO2 to be neutralized, we need to uh, look at kinetics studies, calcite dissolution kinetics uh, studies. And luckily for us, there's been a lot of these studies published uh, during the past few years. Uh, there is a world research group in California that's represented today by Will Burson right here. Uh, they have produced a lot of data describing the dissolution rate of uh, calcite particles, uh, of aragonite particles, synthetic grains, natural grains over a range of temperature, pressure, and for uh, various inhibitors. So if you have a biogeochemical chem model, you may want to look at these, uh, these research to uh, update it a little bit. And this is what it looks like when we look at uh, dissolution of fluxes from the sediment. <coughs> So here we are normalizing the dissolution rate by the seaweed sediment water interface instead of by the surface of each grain. And here's what we look like. The, the fluxes are roughly the same magnitude. Uh, they look a bit more linear, typically like, like a diffusive flux uh, would look like. And here we can see the influence of two uh, variables. The first one is the saturation state of seawater, uh, the chemical uh, side uh, of that reaction. And the other one is the diffusive boundary layer thickness. It's something that's related to the bottom current speed. And I'm going to explain you how it works uh, right here on this little diagram. Here you have the sediment. You have the sediment water interface, the black line here. And you have the bottom waters in blue. The diffusive boundary layer is the layer uh, in red uh, right here. And, uh, and because of the presence of that layer, the concentration of solutes at the interface are different from the concentration in the bottom waters. So an easy way to represent a uh, dissolution flux out of a sediment in a scheme like that is by using an equation of this form. This is pretty much fixed first law of diffusion. We have a concentration difference that is driving the dissolution flux. Uh, the concentration here is the concentration uh, of carbonate ion at equilibrium with respect to calcite in in situ condition. It's the concentration that's reached uh, typically below the interface. Uh, and the concentration of carbonate ion that we have in the bottom water that we can know from databases such as GLODAP. In front of that, we have a little K star. You saw that already in Bernie's talk. It's a mass transfer coefficient, and it's composed of two different things. It's composed of uh, that character, beta, in blue. Uh, it represents typically the time it takes for solutes to go from one side to the other of that diffusive boundary layer. Uh, and that will be uh, dependent on the current speed. So fast currents in the ocean typically 
uh, flatten that diffusive boundary layer so that it, it's faster for solutes to go from one side to the other. And slow occurrence will generate very thick diffusive boundary layer, and that will act as a strong kinetic barrier uh, for, the kinetic, uh, for the dissolution reaction. The other thing in that case star is the sediment side uh, mass transfer coefficient. It represents everything that's happening on the sediment side of the interface. It can be chemical reaction itself at the surface of the grains. It could also be for water uh, diffusion. And it's a, it's a function of the CO, uh, calcium carbonate content in sediment. So what uh, do these two things look like uh, in the real world? Uh, the blue map here shows you the the magnitude of the water side mass transfer coefficient. When it's white, uh, it's very high, and that's where you find the, the faster bottom currents here uh, in the equatorial Pacific. It's very fast. And the diffusive boundary layers are typically very thin, uh, down to 200 microns or even less. Uh, for the sediment side mass transfer coefficient, here is what it looks like. Uh, we can see very well the, the, the dependency on the calcite content. On the north of the Pacific, we don't have any calcite in sediment because they are all below the CCD. So that uh, coefficient is very low. And if we put these two together, that's what we get. That's the overall mass transfer coefficient. So it, it reacti you can see that as the reactivity of sediments. When it's high, uh, if you give these sediments a certain uh, bottom water with a certain undersaturation state, they will be ready to dissolve very fast. So sediments have a very uh, high mass transfer coefficient here, typically in the equatorial Pacific, because the sediments are both very rich in calcite and also currents are very slow and very high. OK, so uh, now that we know uh, how the, the seafloor is ready to react, we need to know uh, the, bottom, uh, the bottom water chemistry just above the seafloor. And for that, we use some glow depth data. We also need to know the calcite content uh, of sediments. Uh, for these, we use that uh, database called DBCBED. It's compiled by Chris Jenkins at uh, Boulder, Colorado. Here is what uh, the carbonate ion construction looks like today in bottom waters. And here is the human uh, component of that. When it's red, it means that we have a, we have a strong drop. We, have, we had a strong drop uh, here in the carbonate ion construction. So that represents the difference between the construction today and the construction uh, 200 years ago at the end of the pre-industrial era. So that's what you see here is bottom water acidification being most uh, important in the north of the Atlantic. And now we can uh, compute the dissolution rates uh, because we have everything we need. So here's what it looks like. Uh, we have a dissolution rate of zero on the top of the mid ocean ridge because bottom waters are typically uh, super saturated. Uh, the dissolution rate is very high, uh, especially here in the equatorial Pacific, but also here in the north of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And this map on the bottom shows you the uh, anthropogenically driven uh, calcite dissolution rate in sediments. Uh, it's uh, statistically significant here at the north of the Atlantic, where we have a lot of CO2, where currents are fast, where we have some calcite in sediments. Uh, and we have so a couple of hot spots in the Southern Ocean. But for the most part, it's still within the air bar uh, that we show here in red. So here's a discussion idea. Why are the uncertainties so high in the deep sea? We can go back to that in the panel discussion. Uh, and now I, uh, I wanted to, uh, to discuss a little bit the question we're asking at the beginning. So how does that relate to uh, all the carbon that we are putting in the atmosphere, to all the carbon that we are putting in the ocean? Here, uh, this is data directly from, uh, from this paper. Uh, and uh, to compute the neutralization rate of CO2, we have to use that equation, but we have to modify it a little bit. Uh, because in reality, some of that bicarbonate ion that's produced by dissolution will actually react back and give some CO2. So we have to correct that slightly. It's very well described uh, in this paper by Smith and Gattuso. And basically, we just have to add a coefficient here uh, that's about 0.8 in the deep ocean. It's a bit higher in the surface ocean. Uh, and that means that for every molecule of calcite that we dissolve in the deep ocean, we have about 0.8 molecule of CO2 that's being neutralized. So if we multiply uh, our dissolution rate by that, we should have the neutralization rate. So this is what I did right here. Uh, I summed up the dissolution, uh, only the, the anthropogenic dissolution all over the seafloor and uh, made it a function of time. 
here I use another database, uh, the one, the DIC database of Cathy Walla, uh, simply because he made that available year after year. And this is what we get. So here are three uh, back of the envelope uh, numbers. Right now, to put that in perspective, you may have heard uh, that if we uh, divide the amount of CO2 that we had in the ocean uh, each year by the number of humans on Earth, it means something like four kilograms of, uh, of CO2 that we are adding per human uh, per day to the ocean. I find that huge. And if we do the same thing for that red curve here, for the dissociation rate, uh, actually, it means that we are uh, dissolving about 70 grams of calcium carbonate at the seafloor uh, just because of anthropogenic CO2, and that's per capita per day. Uh, if we uh, add all the dissolution that has been going on, uh, just the anthropogenic dissolution since the end of the pre-industrial era, that's the amount uh, that we get. It's hard to represent what that actually is. And uh, the most important to me, is to compare the CO2 neutralization rate to uh, this one on the top, to the total emission rate. Uh, summing up all the anthropogenic CO2 uh, neutralization rate today at the seafloor, even though the seafloor is, uh, is more than two-thirds of the surface of the planet, we get something that's tiny. It's 40% of the CO2 emission rate of a city like Montreal, where I live. That's, that's terrifying. Uh, now, uh, how could that change in the future? Uh, I did a couple of tests. Uh, using CMEP5 models throughout this 21st century. And here I just wanted to, to discuss with you uh, a couple of variables that could have an impact on calcite dissolution rates at the seafloor, and that will change independently in the future, and we're just going to try to see how could that affect the calcite dissolution rate. The first one is the calcite flux to the seafloor. In the future, we'll have less calcite delivered to the seafloor. That means uh, less stuff to dissolve. Uh, the sediment water interface, but it also means that the CCD will rise much faster. So it's very hard to predict what the impact of that will be on the actual dissolution rate. Another one would be the bottom current speed. Uh, the bottom current will actually slow down. Uh, this, these are results from six different models here. Uh, this is a world average. And here we have the, the year 2100, roughly here. It goes a bit further in time. And all models that I've tried show bottom currents that are slowing down. It's especially important in the north of the Atlantic, where we can actually measure some of that slowdown uh, right now. And these, uh, these changes are pretty small, but locally it, it can be important, and that tends to increase the thickness of that diffusive boundary layer, uh, potentially decreasing a little bit more the dissolution rate. And the last one is the organic carbon flux to the seafloor. Uh, most of the ocean here is red, meaning that we have more organic carbon reaching the seafloor at the end of the century than what we have today. And that potentially has strong impacts too. More organic ma uh, matter coming to the seafloor means more organic matter to respire within sediment. It could also mean more bioturbation, more irrigation. So again, it's very hard to predict what will be the impact of all these things as long as we don't have a model that takes into account all these variables, their interaction, and how do they affect a uh, single phenomenon? And so in our case, calcite dissolution at sea floor. This is another point we could discuss in the panel discussion, because I think that could impact, uh, particularly the organic carbon, uh, all of the presentation you have heard in this session. And on that, I uh, would like to thank my collaborators. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. with some time to spare and just uh, so you know that what's happening behind the curtain there'll be a computer switch out while during this uh, question session so don't let that bother you. Uh, questions for Wilf, the audience. Wilf Gardner, Texas A&M. Thanks for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. One thing that I had a question about, you showed on uh, your second slide it showed the distribution of anthropogenic uh, CO2 uptake, and very heavily in the western North Atlantic. What puzzled me is that uh, I would expect the same sort of thing uh, over in the western Pacific with the Kuroshio extension because of high uh, eddy kinetic energy mixing and so on. Yeah. So why do you think that that is so low? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't involved in the, the papers that uh, derived the, the content of anthropogenic carbon in the ocean. It's based on, uh, on an inverse model technique. Uh, 
Uh, I'm really not a specialist of how that works. Uh, it's not observations. So it might very well not be perfect, and we might very well be missing some of the anthropogenic carbon. OK, thank you. Chris Sabine, Hawaii. So, so to answer your question, which is not, I meant to ask a question, but it, uh, the issue is you're not forming the deep waters in the Pacific that you're forming in the Atlantic. So you're not moving that, that carbon, that anthropogenic carbon away from the surface layer into the interior. So you can't, you can't take up as much in the North Pacific as the Atlantic. My question is, um, so y you seem to focus on the dissolution of the carbonates in the sediments. What's your perspective on the dissolution of these particles as they're settling through the water column? How much does that contribute, and how might that change? Uh, so I, I did time? some uh, quick test about that. They are in my PhD studies. Nothing is published, so uh, don't believe me too much on, on what I'm going to say. But from, from what I've seen, uh, the chances are very low in uh, most places because, especially in the Atlantic, for example, most of the Atlantic is super saturated. It's only just above the bottom that we start having in the saturated water. So even if we have a fair amount of anthropogenic CO2 there, the relative change will be slow. Uh, in the north of the Pacific, uh, on the other way, uh, the, the flux that is reaching the sediment is is very slow compared to the flux that we had at the surface. Uh, we have only a, a small fraction that's reaching the sediment. So even if we don't have a lot of anthropogenic CO2 in this basin, it's likely to be more affected. But I think the place where I was finding uh, the, the bigger impact on, uh, on the water column dissolution of anthropogenic CO2 was the Southern Ocean. Because over there, the calcite saturation depth is both quite shallow, and we also have a fair amount of anthropogenic CO2 going in. So in the Argentine basin, for example, uh, which is very deep, I'm sure we'd see a very big influence. This has been an ongoing debate. We keep hearing this, but the only way that I can balance the alkaline effect is there must be significant water column dissolution. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What I was just telling you is about abiotic uh, dissolution. Uh, there must be another way. There must be a dissolution going on in the guts of the plankton that that uh, I was not able to model easily. That's why I didn't do it. Uh, and most people uh, use uh, use proxies to, to derive that. It's pretty hard to, to compute uh, from, from the bottom. So we can use things like excess alkalinity. But again, it's not that straightforward because uh, I've seen presentation uh, during this workshop saying that some of the alkalinity that we would consider it as excess is not actually from the solution, but could be from organic acid or things like that. So it, it's, it's a complicated question. Right now, I, I can't have a full answer to you. Maybe I'll throw in a, a wrench in this, because you haven't really differentiated aragonite to solution. Maybe that. Chris, can you get enough of your alkalinity through aragonite to solution? Can you get enough of your alkalinity flux through aragonite dissolution in the water column? Because he's been dealing mostly with calcite. I don't know, where's my <laughs> so I would argue that the answer is yes. And it's not all models. Um, we're starting to get to the point with some of these decadal time series where we can actually see this water column dissolution uh, through our decadal time series observations. So that was what I was going to throw in. Um, the weak calcium carbonate dissolution may actually be much more important in the water column than in the mm. sediments. Yeah, I've seen papers about that recently saying that the, the argonite sinking flux from the surface is much more important than we, that we thought. So in this study, we, we don't actually use any flux from the surface. We derive them from sediments, which we sink are all calcite. Uh, but it, that could very well explain water column processes. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. Um, this idea of water column dissolution, of course, is very old. Manuel Fiodero in the late 1970s created some of the first models of the carbonate system for the oceans. And the first thing he noticed is that between 500 meters and 1500 meters, you needed a source of alkalinity. He couldn't identify it. It's, as you have indicated, probably dissolution. There's been other ideas you know, some sort of export from shelves and this sort of thing. But I think it is some sort of dissolution, probably caused by um, oxidation of organic matter associated with the, uh, with the um, 
uh, with the calcite that's falling out. That's just a guess, okay? But it's, it's the best way to do it in supersaturated water is just create a source of, of, of CO2. One last question. Jim Bishop, UC Berkeley. Um, I've been filtering seawater for decades. Uh, <laughs> and I'm an expert on fish poop as well. But, but one of the main observables from large volume filtration is in the Atlantic, when I proposed my PhD dissertation, I was gonna use calcium as the inert tracer for flux and ratio all the elements, like POC to PIC, and of course, POC went down with depth relative to calcium, and I was happy as a clam. Then I started doing filtration in the Pacific, and uh, it's, there hasn't been a single profile that hasn't seen PIC attenuate at the same rate as POC. And during the Vertigo experiment that Ken Bissler ran several years ago in the Oyashio, we were clearly above the saturation horizon, and there is large-scale observations of DIC dissolution in the water column. Mm -hmm.